never met before, my name is Jonathan. My wife, Natasha, and I are the lead pastors here at EC. And uh, like has been said in your room, this is the second week of a series we're in called The Face of God, or, or The Faces of God. I'm not sure how you, how you read it. Um, okay, I'd, I'd like to know, though. So just show of hands. This isn't, this isn't really important. When you look at that, like we threw in the S to mess with you a little bit. Do you, do you read it like face of God? Anybody? Okay, and then faces people? Okay, faces plural it is. All right, away we go. Uh, our, our lead scripture is first Quran. The, you, the bracket makes it optional, right? That's why I'm asking. Like you can pick and choose. If you want it to be faces, it can be faces. If you want it to be just a face, you're, you're good. Okay, uh, First Chronicles chapter 16, verse 11, which is, which is in the Old Testament, says, look to the Lord and his strength. Seek his face always. Uh, seeking his face sounds simple enough that we would seek the face of the Lord to look at him. Uh, looking at somebody's face is an easy concept, concept when we're talking about interpersonal communication. Now, there are, of course, some parameters to face-to-face -face conversation that we should all be mindful of. Things like you don't hold eye contact for too long. If you're having a face-to-face -face conversation with someone and they're locked in on you and you don't look away, they say every three to five seconds. If you don't just give a little break every three to five seconds, you're a psychopath. All right, so don't do, you don't just keep looking. Um, another rule of face-to-face -face contact I found for eye contact is that it's the 50-70 rule. So you're supposed to make eye contact, be looking at somebody's eyes 50% of the time while you're talking to them, and then 70% of the time while you're listening. And I'm not sure how that works, uh, but this is what the study I read found. And it's also been my... Uh, my, I've done my own research, uh, it's been my married experience, that generally when you're talking to your spouse, you want 100% eye contact and you get, well, if she's on Instagram, almost none, wow. almost zero. Now, okay, what I've also discovered is that there is nobody else self-righteous as the spouse who wants to have the conversation. Right, So when I'm trying to talk to her and I feel like it's really important, and it could be about nothing, but because I want to talk to her, I, I get righteously angry if she's got her phone in her hand and she's looking down. I'm, hey, look at me. Like, you chose to spend your whole life with me. I want eye contact from you. You're, like, You're not talking about anything important. Everything I say is important. And I just get, I get self-righteous. A husband and wife should be able to look each other in the eye when we talk. What's wrong with you? But then 30 seconds later, I could be into the same sports article that I've read 37 times. And she could be telling me all about her day. And she will then become the self-righteous one and say, hey, get your face out of your phone and look at me. Because there's something about actually looking a person in the face, looking eye to eye. Um, how do you look? God eye to eye when we know he's not somebody we can see. Well, the Bible helps us a little bit. Scholars believe that the Gospels, that's the first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, reflect the faces or attributes of who Jesus is, his humanity, his kingship, his servanthood, his divine nature. So if we want to see Jesus face to face, we go to the Gospels, we read them, and we get this reflection. It's like having an eye-to-eye, face-to-face conversation with Christ. Today we're going to read a story from the Gospel of Mark. Before we do, I want to take a moment and pray together. God, thank you that we're not just in rooms. We haven't just gathered in seats and chairs and in buildings. But God, we're here with you in your presence. Thank you that both here, southeast, southwest, those may be watching online or through the week, God, you are right here with us, speaking to us from your word. We ask that you challenge us, change us, and help us to see you face to face. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Mark chapter 4 and verse 35. It says, that day when evening came, he, that's Jesus, said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side, leaving the crowd behind. They took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. 
Uh, so Jesus has been uh, teaching and performing miracles all day um, in order to be able to project and, and reach the crowd. He's actually drifted out a little bit from shore in a boat, being in a boat, um, allowed him, allowed his voice to sort of magnify over the water. He used the boat as a bit of a platform. At some point, he wraps up his keynote and then he says to the disciples, hey guys, that's enough. Let's wrap this thing up. We're going to head over to the other side. There are a few things that strike me from these couple of verses. Firstly, um, there is another side. There's another side. It's easy to read over a detail like that, but that might be the very detail somebody in one of our rooms needs right now. There's another side. It might not seem significant to everybody, but I'm sure there's somebody, there's some person in the room today, and you can't wait to get to the other side of whatever it is you're living through and experiencing in the moment. You can't wait for what you're walking through to be over. You can't wait for something, a dynamic, a situation to change. And I want to encourage you today, what you're seeing isn't all that there is. And what you're facing isn't all that there is. Where you are right now isn't all that God has planned and prepared for you. There is another side. You're going somewhere. You might not be there yet, but there's another side. And that might be the shot of hope you need because it's been grief and it's been stress and it's been overwhelming. But despite all that you might be facing in the moment, there's another side. You're on your way somewhere. There's another side to your story. And Jesus today is saying, hey, let's go there together. You know what else I noticed? Um, I noticed that after a long day of teaching, crowd management, all the things that Jesus and the disciples had going on, when he wraps things up, he doesn't say, hey, guys, how you feeling? What do you want to do tonight? He doesn't say, how's, how's everybody? Oh, Peter, you must be hungry. You guys want to head back into Capernaum and grab a bite? No, Jesus just says, hey, we're going to the other side. When, Jesus? Now. We're going now. He doesn't give them any details. He doesn't tell them why. He doesn't even engage in a conversation. He doesn't give any explanation whatsoever as to why they have to go to the other side. He could have said, hey, guys, let's head over to the other side to have a morning meeting. We need to just travel through the night. I want to get over there. And he gives them no details whatsoever. He just gives a clear instruction. So just in these couple of verses, we see not only is there another side for everybody, but we see a lesson in obedience. Without knowing why, he says, let's go. So to be obedient is to comply or to submit to someone else's authority. In a Christian sense, I've heard this definition. I kind of like it. To follow God's direction without knowing the details. To follow God's direction without knowing all of the details. They don't need to know why they're going. They just need to know the way they're going. Jesus says, hey, we're going over there. That's the way. And there are some ways that we hesitate to follow because we don't know the why. We get, well, I would, I would be obedient, but I just have to know a little bit more information. I would say yes to doing that. I would obey God. I would make sure this thing in my life aligned. I just need to know why. It's not my job to know why. It's not your job to know why. You know what our job is as Christians? It's not to know everything. It's to know one person and to obey him. That's it. It's one person and we do what he says. That is our responsibility as Christians. My job when God says go is to say, all right. My job when Jesus says, hey, it's time to go this way. I, I, I can say, hey, God, I, full, I don't fully understand, but I'll go. Hey, God, this doesn't make sense to me, but my answer is still yes. Hey, God, I would love to have more information, but the response from me, the default setting in my heart is, yep, I'll do what you've asked me to do. And what I've learned is that when I obey, it's only a matter of time before why becomes obvious. You'll find that. You could sit at the starting line and beg for why and never get it. But if you say yes and are obedient and go one foot after the other, following God with faithful obedience, there'll be a point when you look back and like, that's why. 
Oh, I didn't know that when he asked me to go. And if I had known when he asked me to go, I might not have gone at all. But now that I'm here, oh, that's why. That's why God asked me to live that way with my finances. Because now I'm here and I can see that I'm not controlled by possession. Oh, that's why. That's why God asked me to, to, to give my sexuality to him and give my relationships to him. I didn't understand it at the time. It was contrary to how I was feeling and my desires. But now I can stand back and be like, man, that saved me a lot of hurt. That saved me a lot of pain. That saved me a lot of torment. I get why after I've followed his way. And so it begs the question, are we willing to obey God, it's an important question. And if, and if we're going to be Christians, we actually have to ask ourselves that question. And to be honest, it's not something you ask once. It's kind of a question you have to answer every day. Because there's always going to be something. Oh, God, do I really? Yep. Why? Not telling you. Oh, that's kind of what it's like. And you got to make the decision every single day. Okay, God, I'm going to. That's what it means to have faith. If we had why, we wouldn't have faith. But because it's a walk of faith, it doesn't need to be a walk of why and answers and clarity. And sometimes we make an idol out of clarity. God, I'm, I'm going to, I need, I need clarity before I can go. No, you don't. You need faith before you can go. And it says they took Jesus as he was. I... I did not, when I, when I started reading Mark chapter 4, verse 35 to 41, I did not think I was even going to say anything about these two verses. I thought we were just going to skip past 35 and 36. And then you read a little statement like they took Jesus as he was. You're like, whoa, caught me off guard. Because, because I actually think it's important that we take Jesus as he is, not as we want him to be. There, there's a problem I would say culturally we have a problem right now that there are a lot of different versions of Jesus floating around. I'm not talking Talladega Nights, Ricky Bobby, Christmas Jesus, baby Jesus, grown up Jesus. No, no, no. I'm talking like um, people seem to want to order up a customized savior that suits my liking and my desires and my behavior. It doesn't make me feel uncomfortable. So we want compassionate Jesus. Oh, his heart breaks for me all the time. I want loving Jesus. And you think he's like a desperate boyfriend, just hoping that someday you'll call him back and be like, I love you too. Or gracious Jesus, a.k.a. I can get away with anything, Jesus. Or affirming Jesus. He would never want me to change. He loves me just the way I am. Now, now it's interesting because we like to, like that, those are the liberal Jesuses. And wait, do not get political <laughs> and do not get self-righteous because the conservatives have a Jesus too. There's the tell the truth, Jesus. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is near, Jesus. It's the turning tables, Jesus. I love that one. It's the fight the religious establishment, Jesus. It's the anti-authority, Jesus. It's the comes in power, Jesus. We all have our own Jesuses. But we don't get to custom order Jesus. You can't say, I want a healthy dosing of grace and just a side of truth. It doesn't work like that. You, you can't have some of Jesus and not take the rest of Jesus. When you get Jesus, you get the Lamb of God who was slain before the foundation of the world, but you also get the Lion of Judah who stands triumphant at the end of time. When you get Jesus, you get equal portion servant and Savior. You get fully God. You get fully man. You get full grace. You get full truth. You get full love. You get full justice. When you get Jesus, you get the one who validates women, who cares for the poor, the orphan, and the widow. You also get the one who rules and reigns on a heavenly throne with streets of gold. When you get Jesus, you get the one who loves you unconditionally, yet hates the sin that is slowly killing and destroying your life. When you get Jesus, you get the one who called the little children to come unto him. You also get the one who rides in on a horse with a sword and blood all over his robe. When you get Jesus, you get the whole package. 
we don't get to pick and choose. I don't want a version of Jesus. I want Jesus just as he is. They take him. Hey, Jesus, hop in our boat. We're not even going to go back to shore. We want you just as you are in our boat. And yes, sir, we will head to the other side. And they head out on the water. And there were also other boats with them. And verse 37 says, a furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Um, I have a couple of thoughts on storms. Uh, this is not meant to be a lesson in uh, meteorology. Uh, but I do think what we know about weather and storms can help serve as a metaphor for the storms of life. The first thing I'd like to suggest today about storms is that storms are in the forecast. Storms are in the forecast. Storms were actually quite common on the Sea of Galilee. It happened all the time. It was not new news. A storm was not unique to these people in this story, in this place, in this situation. Storms happen and storms in scripture represent this unsettled, unpredictable, unbridled power and chaos. In fact, in ancient mythology, storms and the sea were this picture of power and evil and the unknown and things that happen that you can't control. And so if I were to make a spiritual weather forecast for you today, I would say this, storms are in your forecast. There will be storms. You might have just come out of a storm. You might feel like you're in the middle of a storm. You might be heading into the waves, but I'm telling you, whether you feel like you need it right now or not, storms are part of life and storms are in your forecast and storms will come. It, not all of life is going to be smooth sailing. And, and I know that that you don't expect it to be, but sometimes when we start living for Christ, we expect the storms to kind of settle. And the truth is, Christianity is not this guaranteed weather control system. It's more like a raincoat. <laughs> It'll be in the storm, Jesus will help keep you dry. And it's not a guarantee of clear skies, sunny days, and beach weather. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. But wh why do we have storms? So sure, the government cloud seeds and controls the weather. But outside of that, outside, that's not, guys, we know that. That's not a thing. They try to, they, they try to stop the hailstorms. That's like, it's a good thing, right? It's a good thing. Um, I don't know what's wrong with you. All the chemtrails. That's a good thing. Uh, okay. A couple thousand years ago, I'm just playing, uh, around the Sea of Galilee, uh, there was no manipulating the weather. Things happened. The Sea of Galilee is 700 feet below sea level, but just 30 miles in the distance, you have Mount Hermon, which is 9,200 feet high. And so what would happen is you've got these, um, these flows of cold air coming down off. The, there's a 10,000 foot gap and you would have cold air coming down from the mountain range, mixing with warm air coming up from the sea. And it would create these violent weather systems, these storms, these squalls, these waves, this chaos that would show up quickly. You could have a clear day. You get it. It's like Calgary weather. It could be a clear day. Then it snows and then you're sun tanning and then it rains and it just all happens. It's crazy because you've got high highs in the mountain range and low lows in the sea. And so the storms on the Sea of Galilee happened because of high highs and low lows coming together in a relatively small space. When high highs meet low lows, things get chaotic. Now that's true in weather systems. It's also true in life systems that when you swing from high highs to low lows, Life can feel out of control and crazy, and it can be hard to determine which way you're heading. It's chaotic to have high highs and low lows. I, uh, I sat with somebody this week, a friend in a hospital room, held her hand, and prayed that God would heal cancer 
even though it doesn't look good. That's a low, low. I think what made that low worse was that just a couple of weeks ago, the same friend was on stage singing in the Easter choir. And so you've got a low, low, and a high, high. And how do you reconcile going from the high of like a life dream to the low of critical condition? How do you go? From high highs to low lows, I got a phone call from a friend yesterday that I've known for 20 years. They have a 16-year-old boy. It was just his birthday. That's a high high. And the call yesterday was, can you pray for my son? He had some back pain. We took him into the hospital to get checked out. And now he's at BC Children's Hospital because they found a tumor the size of his lung in his chest. How do you go from high highs to low lows. How do you go from things are great at work and I'm celebrated and I'm successful to terrible at home and stressful and anxious, high highs, low lows? How do you go from, man, you love your kids and you love your spouse, but you lost your job. It's high highs and low lows. It's emotionally chaotic. How do you go from, I'm out with my friends and everything's good and I'm surrounded by people that love me, back to an empty bedroom and a lonely bed. It's high highs and low lows. Life comes at you in highs and lows. And it can be chaotic. The wave of emotion goes up and down. God, how can I feel so good in one moment and so empty in another? God, how can I celebrate and hold this child in my arms, but then I'm so broken by by a pregnancy test that comes back negative. It's high highs and low lows. And the disparity of our life can create distress. And, And I think we need to remember that highs and lows create storms. So does obedience. Because the disciples, they sail right into a storm and they're just trying to do what Jesus asked them to do. And when you're trying to move forward and make God a priority, well, when you decide, hey, you know what? I need to change the influences in my life. I need to make some changes to my friend circle. I'm going to change my value system. I'm going to adjust my priorities. Things need to be a little bit different. Um, it could be something as simple as like a response to last week's message. Like I'm going to read my Bible every day. And I'm going to pray with my spouse. Or I'm going to pray every day. Uh, men, you're going to take spiritual leadership in your home. Women, you're going to pray and intercede. It could be something as simple as doing those things. And all of a sudden... With obedience comes opposition. There might be a storm because of disparity, but there might also be storms because there is a devil and there are demonic powers that do not want you to get to the other side. There are powers that do not want you to move forward and cross over from where you are today into the person you're becoming. Do not want you to go from here to where God has called you and created you to be. Don't be surprised by opposition. Don't be discouraged when it comes. Don't turn around. Don't give up. Don't quit. Don't stop. Listen, in sports, there would be no joy in victory if there were no opposition. It's NHL playoff time. I don't really want to talk about it. Stupid. Stresses me right out. But even, like, just imagine with me that your team loses game one of their series. If the Lord didn't allow that storm, the seven game victory would not be as sweet. I'm just prophesying with big faith. I don't even know if I believe it. Jesus is like, it's not gonna happen. I can't, I can only do so much. Well, here we are. But, But imagine If there was only one team that took the ice, imagine if you could just go out there and score as much as you want to and there's no opposition, well, then the the victory has no value. It's the fact that there's an opposition to me moving forward that gives value to my victory. And when you understand that what God has for me on the other side is better than where I am right now, you know that one step is a victory and one paddle in the sea is a victory and another step is a victory and I'm gonna keep going against opposition. Listen, here's the issue. Everybody wants to win. Nobody wants to war. 
Who doesn't want to cross over to the other side? Everybody. Oh, yeah, I'd love to step into everything that God has for me. No, I don't want to pay a price. I don't want to break a sweat. I don't want to sacrifice. I don't want to have to leave the other side. No, I, can, I, can I have both? Everybody wants to win. Nobody wants to war. Nobody wants to struggle. Nobody wants a storm. But it's inevitable if you're going to go through. I mean, some people are going to make the decision, man, I don't just want what's on the other side. I want what's on the other side bad enough to press through the opposition in the middle. They are leaving a place called Capernaum. Capernaum means village of comfort. Catch the picture with me. They have to push off from the shores of the village of comfort to get to where Jesus has called them to go. And in the middle, they are abruptly, we'll say, not attacked. I mean, they are, they're assaulted. They're opposed by a storm. There's conflict when trying to move from where I was comfortable to where I'm called. There's always going to be conflict when you have to move from where I'm comfortable to where I'm called. And, and the storms might be external and the storms might be things you can see and you can point to and you can call in some people and say, hey, pray with me. We're just facing this storm. But the storm might be on the inside because everybody has two sides. And so there is part of me that loves to be comfortable. And I've built a life around being comfortable. And I've been, built a life around just doing things the way I do them and seeing things the way I see them. But God is calling me out of my comfort zone into a calling and a purpose. And if I'm going to actually go, I'm going to have to deal with some internal conflict because there's one side who I used to be. There's the other side who I'm going to be. And I'm in the middle right now. Well, you know what I find interesting about this is it says in verse 36 that there were other boats with them. So they push out from shore and there's all these other boats. Guys, you're going on a trip? Amazing, we're gonna come with you. We'd love to go to the other side. We're, gonna, we're just gonna sail. Besides, it's gonna be great. We're just a, a big convoy of boats. We can't wait to get to the other side. This is awesome. That's verse 36. Boats. Verse 37. A furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat. So there were a lot of boats. Once a storm hits, there's only one boat. See, because company doesn't stick around in turbulence. See, because there'll be people in your life that are like, hey, when it's good, we're good. When it's good, I'm with you. But the minute you want to change and the minute there's some conflict and the minute things are a little bit disruptive, man, I don't know if I'm in for that. And there will be other boats that start to just drift back to the shore that you're coming from while you're on the way to the place that God created you for. And I want to encourage you. It's okay to say goodbye to some of those influences. It's okay to say bon voyage to some of those voices that were holding you back. It's okay to say see you later to some of the friends that were not helping and you get to the other side. There's going to have to be a point in your life when you're like, hey, we're headed into a storm and you're either going to grab an oar and you're going to row with me and you're going to bail with me and we're going to get there or I don't need you. There's one boat in the storm. It's not just any storm. Matthew, when he writes this story, because Matthew, Mark, and Luke all write about this particular story. Uh, he uses the word seismos to describe the storm, which is a word that translates earthquake or apocalyptic upheaval. I like that, apocalyptic upheaval. I wonder if we hear that in the news at some point. <laughs> yeah, it's a big storm out there. It's an apocalyptic upheaval. That would freak people out. <laughs> Grab all your canned goods. Um, here's the thing. What Matthew is saying, this storm is so bad, it could be the end. And, and I find that interesting because several of the disciples were experienced fishermen. They had fished on this 
sea. They, they knew the Sea of Galilee. This wasn't a surprise to them. They'd navigated troubled waters before, but this time they're facing something so great. Matthew says it could be the end. And it says the boat is nearly swamped. Swamped means overwhelmed, but it's not quite overwhelmed. It's nearly overwhelmed, so it's not underwhelmed. It's whelmed. <laughs> or like mostly whelmed. It's almost fully whelmed, but not quite but here's the issue. These experienced anglers would have, at the sign of water getting into the boat, they wouldn't have just sat there. They know better. They would have grabbed buckets and they would be bailing the water out. So the fact that experienced fishermen are now in a boat that is ready to sink because it's almost overwhelmed means that despite their best efforts to bail the water out of the boat, they can't keep up with the waves that are crashing in. They're taking on water at a greater rate than they can get ahead. And even though they are putting all of their strength strength into staying afloat. It's not going to work. I, I believe the message today is, is for anybody who's in a storm, heading into a storm, or maybe someone who knows your life has been taking on water and you're trying to stay afloat, but you are running out of room. How does Jesus respond to the storm? It says in verse 38, Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion, Classic Jesus. <laughs> the disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? Oh, what are we learning about Jesus? I only have two points for you to write down today. The first thing I want you to know about Jesus is that he sleeps in storms. It seems really obvious, I know. Um, but it's actually important to know that God isn't stressed out by the storms that are overwhelming you. It's really important to know that, that Jesus is never stressed out by the crazy situations that we face. I'm glad Jesus isn't freaking out. Um, if, you're, if you're ever on a plane, um, just watch the flight attendants. And there's a little bit of turbulence. If they're still serving coffee, you're fine. You're good. I'll have, well, I wouldn't have a coffee, but I'll take a soda water with no ice, please. But if the flight attendants start to panic, you should get things right with Jesus <laughs> immediately. Whatever you got to do, confess all the sins, just get it sorted. No, because if they start to panic, if the flight attendants are running up and down and they're crying and they're screaming, I mean, you got a problem if the people who know what's going on are frantic. They are in a storm that has all the disciples afraid for their life, and Jesus is asleep. Why? Because he's not surprised by a storm. He doesn't wake up and be like, guys, what should we do? Does anybody have a life jacket? I don't want to drown. I'm too young to die. No, he's like, I could walk on this if I wanted to. He's not surprised. He is sleeping. And the fact that God is asleep in the storm shouldn't be a point of frustration for you, but should be something that builds your faith because we serve a God who is so big and so powerful and so sovereign that he can handle any and every situation. He holds the entire world in his hands. It is all under his dominion and he is in control even in storms. I looked up um, artists' renditions of Jesus sleeping on the boat. I, I thought it was interesting, all the pictures that came up when I searched. Uh, there was not one yacht, no cruise ships. They, it was all these little boats. And so that means Jesus is not like in his luxury presidential suite sleeping on a king of kings size mattress. He's not oblivious to what's happening in the boat. It's a small boat. And if you've ever been in a small boat, you feel everything. You hear everything. You know what's going on. He's sleeping. I don't know if he's actually sleeping. Sometimes I wonder, did he just have his eyes closed? Or was he just thinking, they'll ask for help if they really need it. Husbands, you, you know what I'm talking about. Because, like, dads, you know, 
Because there is a skill in the middle of the night when you hear chaos coming out of the children's monitors and someone's got a bleeding nose and somebody has puked off the bunk bed. You've got the ability to keep your eyes closed and your breathing shallow and your mouth open just enough. <laughs> your ears are there. You're aware of everything that's happening, but you're thinking to yourself, I don't want to rob her of this moment. <laughs> I'm here if she needs me. But if she doesn't come, I want her to have the opportunity to be the hero of the story, to change the bed on her own, to wipe up the child on her own. I'm just here letting her take center stage. <laughs> I just wonder how aware Jesus was of everything that was happening. I, I bet that even in his sleep, he knew what was going on. And, and their, their reaction is pretty wild. The reaction of the disciples when they say, teacher, don't you care if we drown? Now, it's easy to read the reaction and be like, man, these guys, hey? They don't even give Jesus, like they, don't, they clearly don't know him. You're right. This is at the very beginning of his ministry. They actually don't know. They haven't seen all the miracles. They haven't seen him walk on water. They don't know about the cross. They don't know about all of his power and his empty tomb. This story is recorded in Matthew, Mark, and Luke at the beginning of their gospels because they're trying to teach us something about the nature, the character of Christ. They don't know. And they make, these, they make this big claim, don't you care? If we drown, and instead of getting judgmental on the disciples and thinking, well, I would never say that, let's be honest, we say it all the time. Because when we go through storms, we make these big claims. We, we have this uh, tendency to mistake or misinterpret the sleeping Jesus or his silence in a storm. And we, we think uh, two, two things. We think, one, he's unaware. Like, God, do you even know what's happening? God, do you even know what we've been through? Do you even know the hurt? Do you even know the grief? Do you even know the pain that I'm walking through? God, do you even know? We think he's unaware. Or worse, we think he doesn't care. Because if he knows and he's still quiet, if he knows and he doesn't intervene, if he knows and he doesn't get involved, if he knows and does nothing, God, if you loved me, you wouldn't let me walk through this. God, if you loved me, I wouldn't be alone. God, if you loved me, I wouldn't be stressed. God, if you loved me, I wouldn't be exhausted from trying to bail out my boat and feeling like I'm getting nowhere. God, if you loved me, I wouldn't be here in this storm if you loved me. And he gets up, verse 39. He rebukes the wind and says to the waves, quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. I mean, this is fascinating to me. Jesus, not only does he sleep in a storm, which I hope strengthens your faith, but he speaks to the storm and he only has to say three words. He says, quiet, be still. Imagine for a moment the power somebody possesses to look at a hurricane and say, quiet, be still. If Jesus can quiet a storm with three little words, what can he do to your situation? He talks to the storm like a parent talking to their child. Sit down, don't move. Be quiet, be still, I'll be back. He has that authority. That the wind and the sea stops, and, and, and it's important. It's not just the wind, but it's also the effects of the wind. You'll know if you've ever been on a, a, a wavy beach on a sunny day, it's possible for there to have been a storm and the skies to clear, but the waves to continue rolling. But when Jesus steps into a situation and speaks quiet, be still, he doesn't just deal with the storm. He deals with the ripple effect of that storm and the waves that that storm has caused and the tossing and the turning. And with three words, immediately, everything is still. Be quiet, be still. Three 
words. I did a little digging. How many words does Jesus actually speak in the gospels? And if you take out all of the things that he says that are the same from the same situations in the repetition, they think he said roughly approximately 31,426 words. Just imagine he stops a weather system with three. There are thousands of words left over that you can apply to your situation and I can apply to my situation and I'm sure whatever storm you're going through right now there is a word for you but you know what's more important to me than the words that he said during the storm it's what he said before the storm do you remember what he said before the storm he said let's go to the other side (sighs) see I, I think if the disciples remembered what he said before the storm they wouldn't have even woken him up. They would have just kept going. They would have understood me. That's a little bit crazy. But he said we're going to get to the other side. Yeah, it's, it's, it's unpredictable, but, but he promised we were going to go there together. And if you can remember the promises of God, it will save you a lot of stress in the inevitable storms of life. If you remember that he said, I am your healer, then you can navigate the storm of sickness. If you remember that he said, I'm your provider, you can navigate the uncertainty of not enough. When you remember that he said, I'll be your shield and your defense and your protector and your friend and your hope and your help and your peace. If you remember the promises of God, if you know the promises of God, if you've read the promises of God before the storm, you can save yourself a lot of trouble. That's why we need his promises. And then he says to his disciples, he says, uh, he says, guys, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? I love it. Jesus at no point apologizes. He's not like, guys, I'm so sorry. I was in such a deep, my REM cycle was going crazy. I've been tracking it on my watch. I really didn't want to be disturbed. I had no idea. You wouldn't believe the dream. He doesn't apologize. He says, why are you still afraid? And, and I don't think Jesus is frustrated with them. I'm, I think what he's saying is, guys, how could you possibly have had fear? Your premise is all wrong. You, you thought, that because you were in a storm, I was unaware. Oh, guys, you thought that because you were in a storm, I, I didn't care about you? Oh, you thought because you were in a storm, I was unable to do anything about it? No, no, no. You're forgetting that my presence was right here the whole time. You're forgetting that in every storm, I am ever present. You're forgetting that, that, that in my presence is fullness of joy and peace and hope. You're forgetting that my power isn't only displayed by getting you out of storms. Sometimes my power is on display as we walk through it together. Guys, I don't, I, I, I don't stop every storm, but I'm with you in every storm. I, I do allow people to go through storms because I'm taking you somewhere. Uh, I can love somebody and still be with them through a storm. Guys, I didn't need to use a lot of words. I didn't need to conjure anything up. I didn't need to call anybody else for help. I didn't have to go to a higher power. I am the higher power. I'm present in the storm. I'm powerful over the storm. And I'm faithful to get you through the storm to the other side. And they were terrified. And asked each other, who is this that even the wind And the waves obey him. I love it. Who is this guy? That even the thing we thought was uncontrollable, he controls. Who is this? And I love that the word obey comes in. Who's this? We struggle to obey. We want more information to obey. We're uncertain in our obedience sometimes. Who's this? It's it's almost like there's a sense of rhetoric to their statement. Who's this that even the wind and the waves obey him? As if, if nature obeys him, okay, I'm in. I'll obey him too. If this is is what he can do, and, and, and I tell you this story today because I know you're either in it 
you're out of it or you're on your way to it. There's going to be storms. And I want you to have a face-to-face moment with Christ or where you see him in a moment of worship. When you take a moment to pray, I want you to remember that he's present in every storm that he's powerful over every storm. And even if he doesn't stop the storm, he's faithful to get you through. Would you stand with me in both locations from the front to the back? I wanna pray, pray a very simple prayer today before everybody leaves. And it's, it's just this. And it's, it's a prayer that I think you can echo in your storms. And it's simply just the words of Jesus. Quiet be still. And can I challenge you? It's not necessarily a prayer you need to pray to your circumstance. It can be a prayer you pray to yourself when your heart is raging and the storm on the inside has you freaking out. You can take a moment in his presence, get face to face with Christ. Whew, he's present in the storm. He's powerful over the storm. He's faithful to get me through the storm. So quiet, be still. It's a recipe for peace. So with our heads bowed, and our eyes closed. Jesus, I don't know every situation. God, I don't know the storms that we're facing. I don't know I, I don't know what's going on on the inside. I don't know the worlds that are falling apart. I don't know the questions we have to answer tomorrow. I don't know the things that happened last night. But I know right now that there is not a person in our rooms today that you are not present with in the middle of their situation, that you are not powerful over every detail of the situation and not faithful to get them through exactly what they face. And so God, thank you. Thank you for being face-to-face with us. God, we want to see you face-to-face, eye-to-eye, ever-present, always powerful, always faithful, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed as you're giving your situations to him and allowing him to quiet and still your own heart. There are some people in both rooms that you've actually never made the decision to do your life with Jesus, like you've never invited him into the boat in the first place. And so you're kind of doing your own thing and, and, and it, it can feel like you're just getting thrown around, tossed back and forth. You're not sure how to navigate the future. You're not, you, you know there's something more for you, but you're, you're just unsure. I'm telling you, God brought you into our rooms today so that Jesus could introduce himself and say, hey, trust me. And so if that's you and you know you've been doing life far from God, far from Jesus, and it's time to get your relationship with him right, to invite him in, I'm going to count to three. And if you need to make that decision, when I hit three, I just want you to slip your hand up really quick. Nobody's looking around. It's a moment that you would just say, that's me. I need to trust him with my life. I can't do it anymore by myself. If that's you, both rooms. Here we go. One, two. If that's you, three. Just shoot your hand up so I can see it. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Several hands here in the southeast. We know there's hands there in the southwest. You can put your hands down. If you raised the hand and made that decision, or maybe you're making it in your heart, I want to invite you to repeat this simple prayer after me. EC, let's pray it together. Say, Jesus, I need you. I can't do life without you. Come into my heart. Come into my life. Forgive me my sins. I trust you with my future. Amen.